Good morning and welcome to worship. Isaiah 43 says, Do not fear. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. We live in a time when fear is very real. But we also give thanks that in God we do not have to face our fears alone. Let's prepare our hearts for worship.
single one of us, I'm sure, have burdens on our hearts today. People we're concerned about, fears for the future. If you would like to share your prayer concerns with our church, you can email them to prayers at broadwayumc.net and we have a prayer team who will be lifting you up. Prayer is a reminder that we are in this together. Prayer is a reminder that we are never alone. Let us pray. God of power and majesty, with the rising of the sun, you have raised Jesus Christ and delivered him and us from death's destruction. We praise you for all your gifts of new life. Especially we thank you for all victories over sin and evil in our lives. For loyalty and love of friends and family. For the newborn. For those coming to new faith. And for those now in your eternal home for the renewal of nature, for the continuing witness of the Church of Christ. God of eternity, you are present with us because of Christ rising from the dead and you persist in lifting us to new life in him. We bring to you our prayers for this world so in need of resurrection. Especially we pray for nations and for peoples in strife. We pray for the poor and impoverished at home, in our community, and all around the world. We pray for those we know in particular circumstances of distress. We lift up the diseased and the dying and those who are tending to them. We lift all of our prayers in the name of the risen Christ, and we join together in praying the prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, Erin, how's it going? Oh, it's amazing. Did you know that they made a hot dog that was over 600, and, 600 feet? 600 feet, like, long? Yeah. That's not true. Yes, no. it is. No, there's no way that's true because... It was you, in 2011. Dude, do you even know how long 600 feet is? That's like two football fields. That is super long. There, I, I don't believe it. There is no such thing as a hot dog that's ever been that long. You want proof? Sure. That's the only way I'll believe it is if you got some proof. Right there. Wait, let me see this. What is this? Guinness World Records. Uh oh. A hot dog measuring 668 feet 7 inches was created by Novex SA in the city of Mariano Rogue Alonso, Paraguay on July 15th, 2011 long enough to fill over a thousand hot dog buns. Told ya. I guess you did. Huh. You ever have trouble believing something that seems so outlandish when you can't even see it? Yeah. Yeah, me too, clearly, since <clears throat> I didn't believe you about that hot dog. You know, that reminds me of a story in the Bible. Do um, you remember this past Sunday what we celebrated? Yeah, Easter. Yeah, what happened on Easter? Uh, Jesus rose from the dead. Right, and I bet Jesus is friends, his disciples, and the people that cared about him were really sad and really scared that this guy they loved so much and that taught them so much had died. But I bet the disciples were super, super happy and excited when they saw that he rose from the dead. But there was one disciple. Do you remember his name? Thomas. Yeah, Thomas. 
He wasn't there when Jesus appeared to all the other disciples. So the other, other disciples came and talked to him. And, and he was kind of like me, not believing that there was a 600-foot-long hot dog. He's like, no, there's no way Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, Jesus had to show him the holes in his hands for Thomas to believe. So sometimes we see things or we hear about things like this that are hard to believe. But what's really cool is that we know, even without seeing, that Jesus did raise from the dead. And because of that, we've got a whole lot less to be afraid of, right? Isn't that neat? All right, let's pray. Will you repeat after me? Yeah. All right. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for today. Thank you for today. Help me. Help me. To have faith. To have faith. In you. In you. Amen. Amen. Even though we cannot physically see each other today, we can picture one another's faces. In God, we believe that we are always surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. May you experience God's peace today. I invite you to think about ways that you can make an offering today. You can lift up a prayer. You can reach out to someone. You can give money. You can do a good deed or share your heart with someone who needs to hear good news. There are many ways to serve. How can you make an offering today? Let us pray. Gracious God, you are so generous with us. Help us to be people of faith who think about ways that we can also be generous to others, even and maybe especially during these days. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
reading from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Hear the word of God. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I don't know how you all feel, but every time I step outside my door, even if it's just to walk around the block, I get this sense of fear and anxiety. It's like the virus has become a monster for me, lying in wait, ready to get me. Every person I pass, everything I touch, it brings fear even when we're keeping at a safe distance. I'm connected with fear. Fear is a powerful impulse. Fear overwhelms, fear paralyzes, fear robs us of so much. But fear is very real. Fear was the dominating force in the room with the disciples in our Bible passage for today. We're told that it was evening. Now let's remember that this is Easter evening. Earlier on that same day was when Mary discovered the empty tomb and had testified about her encounter with the risen Lord. Earlier on that same day was when Simon Peter and the other disciple had run to the tomb and found it empty and also found that the grave cloths were cast aside. Resurrection may have been real, but it wasn't making an impact on the disciples. I guess things get a lot harder in the dark. Here they are, and they're huddled together behind locked doors. I imagine they were afraid that every time they heard a noise, it could be the same people coming for them that had come for Jesus. Resurrection had not yet made a difference to them. No getting on with their lives. They were living a nightmare still. 
Those locked doors represent all kinds of things for them, trauma, insecurity, frustration, disappointment, disillusionment, and most of all, fear. Enter Jesus. Enter the risen Jesus. The locked doors are no barrier for Jesus. Jesus stands among them and notice the first thing that he offers to them. Peace. Peace be with you. And also notice how Jesus helps the disciples to recognize him. He shows them his hands and his side. He shares his wounds with him, the scar from the nails, the scar where the sword had pierced his side. Think about that. what that means that Jesus shares his wounds as a way for them to be able to recognize that he is real. This means Jesus is not a ghost. It also means that the risen Jesus continues to demonstrate his solidarity with the wounds that we carry. As human beings, we all have wounds. Some of them are visible in ways that everyone can recognize, but probably most are ones that we work really hard to try and hide. Jesus is modeling something different here. Jesus is known by his wounds, and Jesus shares his wounds as a way to help the disciples see him for who he is. Notice also that Jesus is okay with doubts. It's such a touching scene when Jesus and Thomas come face to face. Thomas missed the meeting. Talk about missing something important. But it looks like Jesus comes back, maybe just for him. And he offers Thomas exactly what he asked for. Thomas said he would not believe unless he saw the scars or saw the mark of the nails, unless he touched his side. And that is exactly what Jesus offers. It looks like Thomas is so overjoyed that he doesn't even have to do the actual touching. The gift of his presence is all that Thomas needs. Jesus is not offended by Thomas's doubts. Jesus does not reject Thomas because of his doubts. Rather, Jesus embraces him. In Jesus, we see grace in action, which can bring reassurance to us in our own doubts as well. But Jesus does not stop with just bringing peace and offering reassurance. There's a purpose for him coming to the disciples and helping to bring them out of their fears. There is work for them to do. And Jesus comes to bring them peace because he wants them to get on with their work of being who they are called to be as followers of Jesus Christ. As the Father has sent me, so I send you, Jesus says. And it's interesting that their first job, their first efforts, have to do with forgiveness. Jesus says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the, the sins of any, they are retained. I wonder if forgiveness is so close to Jesus' heart, because there's a lot of forgiving that needs to be going on before the disciples can even begin to think about getting on with their work. First of all, they need to be able to forgive themselves. Let's remember that every single one of them has betrayed Jesus, not just Judas. Every single one of them ran away. Every single one of them separated themselves when the going got rough. And that also meant they needed to forgive each other. They had let one another down. Their bonds of friendship and loyalty had been challenged. And they also had to find ways to forgive those whom they were being sent to serve. 
They were going to have to find compassion, even for those who rejected Jesus, which included the religious and the governmental leaders. They were going to have to get beyond where they had been in order to move forward to whom Jesus was calling them to be as disciples. It's important to remember that nothing had changed for the disciples in terms of their fears. The dangers that they're facing are still very real. The potential for suffering, even death, Many of the disciples end up being martyrs for their faith. All of that is still real. Nothing has changed outside those doors, but everything has changed in their hearts because they have found faith. Being reminded of the presence of Jesus has given them peace. Being reminded of their mission has given them purpose. Being reminded of the gift of the Holy Spirit has given them courage. I want you to notice one more thing about this passage. We, we, you and I, are actually in it. There's a lot of times when we try to put ourselves in the Bible. We try to place ourselves in the shoes of the disciples. But here we don't even have to pretend. Jesus says to Thomas, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. That's us. And John carries that even further when he says, These are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. We are living in a time of fear, to be sure. But we are also living in a time of faith. And there's a lot of faith work going on. I've found messages of peace and faith in the face of my own fears with moments like the teddy bears I've seen in people's windows that are supposed to be kind of a scavenger hunt for children to help them not be afraid. I've found messages of peace in the explosion of sidewalk chalk all over our neighborhood, art projects from children. And some have even invited us to participate. One left a blank box and a piece of chalk for everyone to fill in with things that we never want to take for granted. I've seen peace and faith at work in the thanks we've been lifting up for all of our essential workers and not just our healthcare workers, but also those who are filling the grocery stores and those who are keeping things clean. And I have found peace and I have found faith because I'm part of the church. I, don't know, I really don't know how I would be facing all of my fears without my faith and without the church. I find that grounding because of my faith and trust in God, but also because of my connections with church folks. So many blessings I have received because we are in this together. And this goes beyond just our church family here at Broadway. Especially as United Methodists, we are part of a worldwide connection of people working together, trying to be witnesses for the gospel. There's so many resources, so much creativity, so much hope and promise that I've been finding through this connectional church. And as a way to be lifted up by that worldwide connection, I want to share a video that was put together for Easter by our discipleship ministry team in the United Methodist Church. People all over the world were invited to sing an Easter hymn together from their own spaces. And it's a hymn by Charles Wesley that most of us probably feel like it wouldn't be Easter if we didn't sing that hymn. 
And I want you to take a look at the video and I want you to notice the faces. Notice the connections. Notice the strength and the courage that is being expressed even as folks are sitting in their own spaces alone. And feel free to sing along. To me, it's a reminder that God's Easter message of life and of promise and of connection and of hope cannot be stopped even by our fears. you to spend some time reflecting on your faith, especially during these times of fear. What courage do you need right now? How can you spread light today? St. Catherine of Siena says, start being brave about everything. Drive out darkness and spread light. Don't look at your weaknesses. Realize instead that in Christ crucified, you can do everything.
Let us offer words of peace to one another. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.